Hello, welcome everyone to the latest Deep Adaptation Q&A with me, Professor Jem Bendel. And I'm really pleased uh, to be joined this month by Elsie Luna and her mother, Heather. And also wonderful to see uh, people joining us from around the world, including uh, parents with, with their children too. So, um, yeah, so uh, I just want to say a few words about, about Elsie before um, we, we I introduce her. Um, Elsie was one of the very first UK child strikers for climate and she co-founded Extinction Rebellion Kids and she was an organizer and spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion and Extinction Rebellion Youth in the past. She's British, Colombian and American so brings that global perspective to these issues uh, and so I was delighted um, to meet her mum when, when her mum was working for XR and learn about learn about Elsie, and I was so impressed. I thought that yeah, it would be wonderful to have the chance to um, talk about climate in general, but also some of the worst case scenarios, deep adaptation in particular, and the implications for young people, but also very importantly, what young people think um, we need to be paying attention to. So, Elsie, um, I believe you're 12 now. Is that right? I'm 11. You're still 11. When's your birthday? October. October 20th. Okay. Okay. Hey, I'm a, uh, does that mean you're a Libran? Me, me too, I think. So, um, super. Thanks for joining. So, I think, um, so my first, my first thing when I, when, I, when I saw your speech recorded on YouTube, I think a speech you gave in Bristol, and then when I saw some of the things you've, you've said and, and also even in an academic article, I'm going, this is unreal. So um, can you tell me something about how you got into this? What, what, what got you started on, on being a, a climate activist and an advocate and indeed sort of thinker on these issues? Yeah, so um, ever since I was little, I knew that the, the planet had a fever. <laughs> but um, only, only a few years ago did I realise that it was bigger than I expected. And so my mum told me about Greta Thunberg. And um, yeah, so she, she'd also had a, a movement, a small movement then, called Extinction Rebellion. So... Um, I wanted to get involved very much with with the um, to become a striker. I was home educated, so technically I couldn't strike, but I could still support, support the movement. And so my mum got in touch with some XR people, and we went down to London, and they organised a protest for us. It was just small, like maybe five or ten people, and then um, so that was. So, so that was like one of the um, first strikes in the UK. Um, I don't see all the striking, but yeah. And so from then on, I sort of got involved in XR and in, yeah, I didn't really get involved in Fridays for the Future much, but yeah, XR a lot more. So, um, so they had a, a bridges action where they occupied the bridges in, in, That's right. I remember, and, yeah. And um, and I wanted to. Well, my mum had earlier told me about some of the like the worst polluters, the factories which polluted the most. Um, and I, well, she suggested that I would go to the headquarters and tell them to to keep their fossil fuels in the ground. And so I definitely wanted to go to that action. Uh, I mean, like, to do that action, because no one else was doing it. And um, we realised then that we were about to move to Germany. So my mum was like, well, should we not do it? And I said, no, I still want to do it. And then and then, um, doing that Bridges action, we found time to uh, go and do some of the companies. And we got some people together to do it with me. And those were, like, some of the core people in Extinction Rebellion, the people who were now like some of the most well-known people in there and so uh, I went up to Shell and BP and other such companies and that's kind of where it all started and then from then on I I got involved in XR in other ways and founded XR mm. So you've so that's interesting the initial focus was to challenge the fossil fuel companies directly 
ahead of then the, the broader sort of trying to disrupt society to bring attention to this. That's interesting. Um, did you did you see much response from from those companies or indeed any any response? No, so when, when I went up to um, some of the first companies, it would either like, you're not allowed to film in here, so we didn't get publicity or, you know, all those sorts of things and nothing really happened. And then um, before lunchtime on the first day, we went up to Shell and they had some construction works going on and, and the guards outside said, no, you're not allowed to even go into the building. So with my small group of a few people, um, we stood out there for almost two hours trying to get them to let, let us in. And it was really cold. It was raining, I think. And um, we stood out there and we chanted songs. And yeah, that was really fun. And eventually someone came out and they, and they brought me in to um, introduce me to the the county chair, the, the country chairwoman of Shell. So that was a big win to get to meet her, but but then it didn't go too well. And obviously Shell was still going. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, that was only the last steps and thing which I did. And the, the, next, the next day I went to BP and I said, well, well basically it was like, um, it's always fun to talk to the guards outside because um, they often agree with you and stuff and basically so so you stand you stand out there I, I stood out there with my small group of people and said um, will you let me in and then the guard said nope you, you can't come in will you take someone out to me to speak to me nope no one's coming we can't do that Shell did it oh wait someone's coming <laughs> oh then, wow you know how to play them against each other <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. So yeah, I got to talk to just um, so a, a reporter, someone who um, talked to people. Um, but obviously, VP is also still going. So yeah. So I'm interested in that. Given how think how bad things um, are, how bad they're becoming, how little is changing, despite such activism in the past, but also this new wave of activism, including young people, famously young people. Um, what do you think we should focus on? Well, what do you think is, what are the lessons that you've learned and you think people should pay attention to about how we should go about trying to create change now? Yeah, so, um, so not too long ago after, after the October Rebellion, which was held by Extinction Rebellion, um, I left Etzar and Etzar did an amazing job raising awareness and stuff, but um, they, they, it turned out that they did have some problems. I think it, it was definitely an amazing learning experience and stuff. So I think definitely what to learn from like all these movements is definitely, hmm. they've, all, they've all raised awareness amazingly. And yeah, I think that was just like absolutely amazing, like like um, making people just at least think about these issues. And so one thing which um, I'm just going to continue using Etzar as an example, one thing which Etzar mm -hmm. was doing was they were um, asking the government to do stuff. And the government has a huge history in not doing stuff. So basically, it, it, you know, I personally don't think that it's going to work very well. The government is going to come up with lots of excuses. The government went so far as declaring a climate and a climate emergency, um, and and like that's that's not enough. That's just completely not enough. Which means that um, I think that the government can only do so much in terms of um, actually creating some good change, and so. So I think Etsa only went so far, and I think one of its problems, possibly another, just like looking from another point of view, is that, so basically, think of it like this. So oppression is the cause of all these different things. Climate emergency, uh, racism, sexism, adultism, when adults think they're better than young people, and disabledism, and all those things. So oppression is the cause of that. And what Etzar did is they said, 
we're going to look at the climate and ecological emergency. And just to say, um, as a point of view, why is this one the emergency? That's, that's like a really big question. Like, like oppression has been oppressing people in so many different ways. And now some white middle class people come out and say, uh, this one is the emergency now. We, we have to work on this one. So the, the growing tension started coming about in XR of whether it's better to, we must look at the climate and ecological emergency. This is an emergency, it's gonna kill us all. It would be a more not to just um, work on this one. And then there are the other people who say, we must look at the root cause of all these things. So we must look at oppression and look at, at it carefully. Otherwise we will get it wrong. And this growing tension turned into like some real problems within the movement and stuff. And then like it started where it seemed like people who went into the movement and often were on the oppressed side um, they thought that the movement wasn't right for them just because um, because it seemed like they were ignoring the fact that oppression had been going on for such a long time. It's really important that we don't ignore that, obviously. Mm. And so that's another thing which went wrong. Um, Can I just uh, summarize just to see if I'm with you on this, Elsie? So I think I'm hearing that you see the degradation, destruction of the environment and rapid climate change. This is really bad in themselves, but a symptom of systems of oppression uh, which involve and exhibit racism, disabilism, sexism. So, um, uh, and, and colonialism, of course, and that some people talk about uh, patriarchy as being this big sort of bad thing that is, means that we kind of damage everybody and nature. Um, that's, you, this is the, the, the broader perspective that you have. And so then when you look at environment issues, environmental activism, you're wanting to see that general and holistic approach. Um, and uh, and you, were, you, you felt that it, on occasion, or maybe more than on occasion, it wasn't, it wasn't understood that way or it wasn't prioritized. And so you've, yeah, and that, so that's, that's fascinating, fascinating to hear. So from that perspective, given that um, the people, I mean, I'm, I'm white middle class and most of the people that I talk to through my professional work are white middle class in the West. What's important for us, people like me, um, you know, um, 47 year old man, um, speaking to a lot of those people that you talk about, what, what, what's, what should we, uh, what should we be thinking about? What should we be working on prioritizing? Who should we be listening to? Yes. Yeah, so I think, um, white middle-class people definitely have <laughs> work to do in terms of, in terms of realizing that <laughs> they're not always the right ones. So I think we definitely need to listen to people who are marginalized by society. So if, if you ask like a rich person, like a really rich white man, what's wrong with society? They probably won't know compared to if you asked, for example, a woman of color. Like, so you really got to listen to these people. And um, they've been going through struggles lots more than um so we're not the first struggle ever definitely like it so isn't the first person like the first movement ever to do as they've done and so um definitely we need to listen to them and learn from them and their perspectives and stuff and yeah because they understand oppression more than we can ever understand and I think that if we don't understand like the wider picture of stuff it's true that we are probably going to get what so, yeah, I think we've definitely got to got a lot of work to do of like. Wow. So I'm here. What you just said there is really important. I think is that even if people like me try to understand, we just can't in the same way because we haven't have got the life experience. And the implication there is that we need to support and certainly not um, get in the way. 
Um, so it's a real, it's a, it's a, it's a question for, for people like me to keep, keep thinking about how, how, how am I helping support plural diverse voices on these issues, um, including when there are issues that I wouldn't prioritize because it's no good if, if white Western middle-class people set the agenda and just try and open the door when it's convenient to us for people from different parts of the world or different ages to speak up. So that's really, it's thank, thank you for that. Thank you very much. I, mean, I was wondering um, also then, um, I think a big, a big thing that's happened in climate recently, um, so I've worked on it since, since um, early 90s, and, uh, but what's happened in the last two years is uh, that people are beginning to feel vulnerable in their own lives in the West, beginning to see that climate change is going to threaten them, disrupt their own lives. And, um, but I was, I was wondering, because some people say that that's really important to recognize, that climate change is here, it's bad, it's dangerous, it's going to disrupt our own lives. And let's start working on that including recognizing the emotions and, and so on. Other people say it's bad to talk like that. It's, it's, it's counterproductive. Um, I was wondering how you look at, I mean, this is your future more than it is, is mine. I mean, so how, how, how do you look at the future when, and when you see all these really, this really bad news and some people saying it's gonna disrupt and even break down our way of life, our societies. When I say our, I'm conscious, I've still got this uh, white Western middle-class hour in my head. Um, so what do you say when you hear those sorts of debates? Yeah, so I think definitely, definitely like, um, you've got a point, like you can be stoked for yourself, but definitely do not ignore the fact that this has already been happening to other people. People have already been through this. It's hit other people already. And like, that's just like really important to not ignore and to take into account. I think definitely um, it's good to keep that in mind and to learn from what they did, see what happened to them, and then make sure that you get it right, whatever you're doing. And to always, um, yeah, just, just keep in your mind that like you're not always going to be like, correct and like what you're doing and you've always got to like listen to other people and what they've been doing too definitely yeah so that's really interesting so the idea of this if we're talking about adaptation to climate change or deep adaptation it's to recognize that um incredible irrev irrevocable that word um disruption to society to people's livelihoods way of life has already been happening because of in climate change because of environmental destruction and even before the current issue you know through colonialism and and trashing of people's environment stealing of their land it's been happening for a long time and we should learn from the people who've been experiencing this and responding to this in their own lives um yeah that's that's really 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 clear um, do you feel that the people that you talk to um, in the environmental or climate movements get that? Do you think they get that? Or is there a lot of work for people like you to do to invite that awareness? Yeah, I think definitely like, um, I, don't, I don't know like every single person in the world personally, but um, obviously huh? I know in... in um, from XR, um, there's a wide variety of points of views, and I think definitely um, sometimes we do get it wrong as a white middle class person. <laughs> we do get it wrong. Um, so, so what I mean by getting it wrong is um, so like to take an example, like for example, conservation. So take conservation. Indigenous peoples um, have been keeping the ecosystem running and they're really important in it. And they belong to their land and they should be able to stay in their land. But often what white middle class people have been doing is they've been saying, oh, um, 
we're going to conserve this land, which means that you're going to have to leave it because we think that you're messing up the ecosystem. Actually, white middle class rich person, actually, you need to you need to realize that you're the one who's messing it up. They belong there and they can work it out. And um, you know, you, you shouldn't be able to take them away from their land and use conservation as an excuse to do so. So bad things can definitely happen in these ways. And, and yeah, and I think it's really important that I believe that capitalism is not the best system at all. And it's um, really good at marginalizing people and they, making people feel excluded and oppressing people. Yeah, oppressing people. And so like basically a lot of these white middle class movements which are popping up and stuff, they accidentally fall into asking for capitalist solutions. And so even if Etsar did get its demands, and even if Etsar did get what it wanted from the government, it would probably end up being a solution which doesn't actually provide a good solution for mm. everyone in the world. It will only provide a good solution for, for example, the white middle class people in Etsar and the white middle class people in government. So we've got to make sure that we provide a solution for everyone and that it yes. gets rid of oppression instead of just getting rid of the problem for us. Yeah, absolutely. If, if the, actually, the cure is worse than, if the cure is from the same place as the disease, then all, all manner of problems. So if we just say, okay, suddenly we're going to do as much as we can to solve or slow climate change but it comes from that same oppressive colonialist dominator um othering mindset and structures as well Stru as you saw you mentioned capitalism so the same structures of power then the the policies that we'll come up with could could cause a great deal of harm so yeah that's that's really 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 um important message and what I'm, I'm feeling a bit of shock, Elsie, at the moment, because um, you say it so clearly and so easily, it's so damn obvious. Oh, sorry. Um, but we don't hear this all that much, um, certainly from what I'm hearing from um, climate leaders. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a bit like, wow, why are we not, why are we not hearing more of this? Um, I just want to mention to everyone who's on the call um, that please do send your message, uh, your possible questions to to Matthew his thing is questions here please um, because I would like to throw it open to to other people um, in in a moment um, I was going to ask though um, Elsie before we do that um, how do you think adults might better support young people like you um, either on climate activism or just in preparing for this this future that you know you've it's it's a difficult place to be an 11 year old now with the awareness you have of the future um or at least it seems to me to be a difficult place maybe maybe you know um, maybe i can learn otherwise but yeah how can we better support young people like you in general and on environment yeah so um just simply like it's not our fault that we were born into this crazy system and it's actually obviously the adults fault that they've let it happen etc etc et which means that i'm not saying that the climate strikes are wrong at all like the fact that children did it but i'm just going to say that as it's not our fault how can we the ones who have to strike and miss our education you know even if their education is bad whatever like have our lives you know <laughs> have our lives um have to be disrupted more than adults do because we're just willing to stand up and see the future clearly more than adults are it's their job to have to create um a better future for us really you know sure we can lead we can we can say this is what you should be doing how dare you not do it whatever but actually technically it's the adults who are supposed to be doing this so uh yeah i think definitely um i think yeah another thing for adults is definitely like um 
children tend to have to leave their minds, to be honest, just because they haven't been influenced, literally had the time to be influenced by the system as much. Which means that it is always important to include children in it, but not to make them do all the job and just say like, yeah, you're going to change the world. You, you, you know, you can join this right here. Yeah, totally. So I'm, um, I've, absolutely fully concur because when I've talked to young people about this predicament we're in um, there's a there's a, a presence a fullness of attention and creativity like this is how it is okay so what are we going to do and when I talk to adults there's a lot more baggage about how do I wish to feel about this how does this fit with my existing responsibilities and my existing story about how I'm a responsible person. When I talk to young people, it's pure immersion in the issue and how do we creatively respond? So absolutely. And, um, and the second thing you said, absolutely. I can't bear it when people say, oh, you know, Jim, I believe in the future because the young people are so different. They're gonna fix everything. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> their activism and their actions show, should put us to shame, not just say, oh, it's okay, they'll fix it. So, yeah, absolutely. So we're going to move to questions now. Um, Mary, um, you're 11. You're in the north of England and with your, 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 with your mum, Harriet. You have a question for, for, for Elsie. Please, over to you. Okay. Uh, so I'm 11 years old and I uh, host a podcast about climate change. Uh, but uh, recently I've been working towards uh, loving uh, the earth through uh, wounds in the places I love. Um, the, the charity is uh, called Radical Joy for Hard Times and it's about knowing the wound of a place but fi and feeling grief about the place but loving it and uh, making an act, act of beauty there. So um, I just want to say... Uh, uh, do you, have you um, done anything uh, like this? Yeah, so on the, on the point, just like thinking of the word charity, just to say about charities, I think they're amazing, you know, they're going to like help the world in many ways. Yet, ideally, um, we would be saying we're not going to like say oh poor people you know marginalized by society all that sort of stuff instead we should be with them and not giving them stuff like they're below us and stuff so i think like the way charity acts sometimes gets a bit dodgy you have to always be careful with that as in like instead of saying like we're going to help the poor people in, for example, Africa or something. Instead, make sure that it's more like we're going to um, be alongside them. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I think I haven't exactly been involved in, in a charity much, I don't think, but um, in terms of that. But yeah, as I said, I have been involved in Etsand a little bit in quite the school future, but not really. <laughs> What, I, what I'd be really interested in, in hearing from you, Elsie, and then also coming back to you, Mary, is, is this issue of um, the healing the, and the reconnection with nature in our own lives, in our own locations. So, um, and how that we can all do this in our own lives, in our own locations. This sort of, um, it's this idea that we're all hurting we're all hurting from the damage that's being done to, to animals, to ecosystems, and to our own future, and to other humans, as, as you've so a, you know, wonderfully talked about, Elsie, in terms of the oppression of peoples around the world and in, even on our doorsteps. But this, this idea of reconnecting with nature and, and, and healing our own hearts, um, is that something that, that um, you think is a good idea, and have you seen it? Do you think it's something that maybe could be integrated into climate activism by young people. Yeah, so I think definitely like healing our minds and stuff and getting closer to nature is definitely always a good thing to do. And it will also end up probably helping us think clearer about what to do otherwise. 
Um, so I think, yeah, that's always a good thing to do and to get children into it, like, <laughs> in a young age is always obviously a fun thing to do anyway, um, to make sure that, you know, we don't get too, too disconnected from nature. Ever. Yeah, yeah. And Mary, I'll put your, a link to your podcast in the YouTube channel description as well. I really enjoyed you interviewing uh, Katie Carr, facilitator with the Deep Adaptation Forum. It was, it was a great interview. We're going to move on now to Ejna. Um, Ejna, if you could say where you're joining us from and your question for, for Elsie or, or for uh, Elsie's mum. Yes. Uh, so I'm assuming I'm unmuted now. I hope you, you can are, hear yes. me. I would apologize that my, it's a little bit dark in here yet. I'm talking to you from the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains in California in what's called the mother load country. The, it was the old gold rush area era uh, area. And, uh, but I happen to be uh, an enrolled member of the Crow Creek Sioux nation in, in South Dakota. <laughs> and all, all indigenous across the whole planet continue to suffer and uh, in point and I love uh, Elsie that you were bringing up the fact that so many people are already facing you know the dismal conditions of what you have said the root cause of oppression and um, and so and then Jem you talking about suffering you know and um that the Western developed world is sort of maybe becoming more aware of it because of the conditions now with COVID coming up. So uh, my question has to do with oppression, this root cause. Um, and have you thought very much about how this oppression or the suffering could be a better focus than just climate activism by itself and and how this could mm -hmm. how we could actually uh bring this more to the fore because in point of fact the majority of humanity is suffering very very deeply and um and be and i hope it's okay um uh, that's I a big enough question in itself <laughs> Sorry, well, i just so. wanted to uh, uh to mm -hmm. thank mary because it's really true, you know, in each location, you know, I don't care if you live in, in, in the middle of the city, there are little grasses growing through the cracks in the cement and uh, there's a consciousness there. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this point up. So I just wanted to acknowledge this, this beautiful action that you're doing. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, so um, just just to acknowledge that I'm so completely with you as a as um, a Native American, I'm so completely with you, and keep fighting. Uh, so yeah, on your point of like how oppression can be more important, yeah, completely like you know the majority of people in the world are being oppressed because of one reason or the other. Um, I think definitely. I think definitely, yeah, um, climate and ecological breakdown is, again, just only a part of oppression, which means that, you know, to look at the wider picture will give us a wider picture of also um, climate and ecological breakdown. Um, so I think, yeah, and because it's affecting already in, in lots of ways, as like climate and ecological breakdown is also affecting people already, but oppression has been affecting people for so much longer as well. And all sorts of, you know, people have been affected and the majority of people are being affected and stuff. Um, I think definitely like it is a really important subject to look at and to work on as um, me as a, and you as a, everyone is like a white middle class pe person. And um, yeah, it's really important that we work on oppression because, you know, it will also just like clear our minds of this like guilt and stuff of like being 
probably on the oppressor side and um yeah definitely like it's a really important subject to look at thank you we've got a question from katie yeah hi thank you um elsie i am so inspired by your energy and your clarity around your values what you want uh, what you're able to do and the way in which you communicate that and um, and I see your mum there with you as well and I'm guessing that your mum's love and support play a big part in you feeling empowered in the way that you do so a big shout out for mum and a big shout out for mums in general um, and you've been talking a lot about privilege and I feel a little bit like the kind, that kind of support and the ability to be so clear about taking action and what your values are is a kind of privilege itself. Um, and I've, I've worked in schools and with children and young people for a long time and I've met lots of children who, who, who don't have that privilege, who might um, encounter the difficulties, the emotional difficulties and the practical difficulties of the climate crisis and just feel all at sea, you know, just lost and panicked and they just want to look away from it, the same as adults as well, um, because they don't know what they can do. And I was wondering about other children and young people that you might know who might fit the description I just said, or children and young people that you don't know, but, um, and what, what, um, who don't feel so sure about the actions that they can take and what your advice might be for them if where they find themselves is, is stuck in a place of fear and confusion which might lead to just wanting to look away from it and also I guess that's the same question is advice for adults who do work with children who who feel like that yeah uh, yeah, good question, definitely. Um, by the way, I love the cat. Um, so, so yeah, um, I think definitely like loads of people are in these um, state of minds where they just think like, it's true that it's really hard to think about these things. Um, and it brings up like really big feelings of guilt and stuff. And um, I'm aware that like lots of people like even unknowingly uh, do do these patterns of thinking that they don't have enough power to do stuff and um, definitely to them I'd love to say like um, you know you do have the power to make a change and so so you just say like we can never overthrow the government we can never get rid of this capitalist oppressing system and all that sort of stuff but basically, like, I believe that the change, obviously, because it can't come from above, because, you know, um, obviously, like, it never has, <laughs> then um, basically, it never probably has, then basically, uh, I think the next best thing is to work within our communities. So you could say, well, why don't we become prime minister or president or whatever? You say, well, yeah, that's a good idea. But how do you do that? Well, you're going to need lots of, well, in the case in the UK, MPs, and to even just become prime minister. And in that case, how do you become an MP? Because you campaign in your constituency, which brings us back to the fact that we should be working locally all the time and that that's probably the best thing to do. So just to knock on someone's door or like to help someone out in, um, in maybe a COVID friendly way at the moment, then um, that will just create a, a really lovely small change which can make someone's day. And really, for something like that, there's no way to say that you didn't win. Like the fact that the fact that you made someone happy, that's a win in itself. So, so that's just like you know the fact that you that you built some community and that you did all those sorts of things to be able to fight like bigger issues and stuff. And yeah, I think it's really important that you realize that like that in itself is a win and that that in itself is really important because even if 
Exxon did manage to get, for example, a citizens assembly, then part of the solution would end up being build community so that you can help each other when the sea rises, for example. So it's like, you know, everything comes back to the community and to just make the smallest of changes in the community is, is j just a win and it's so, so fun to work with people you know and love and that's important to hear because when we get scared with the latest environmental news, um, we can get a bit attracted to the, um, the bold, the, the ambitious, the we're going to change everything um, and we must have, a, we must have a, a plan which matches the, the challenge and people argue loads over what's the best plan. What I've just heard from you, though, I think is as much, it's as important, possibly even more, to focus on how, how we are moment by moment. And, and if we're making a positive difference in our small circle, then that's a win, as well as hopefully adding up to something bigger. Um, so that's really, really, really good to hear uh, a reminder of that from you. Uh, we're going to have a question from Kimberly, please. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Elsie. And uh, again, as Katie said, uh, completely inspiring. Um, my question is, is, I'd love you to say a bit about your emotional journey with all of this. You know, you strike me as, as very happy, very upbeat, as you should be. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, but have you experienced periods of, of you know, darker emotions? Um, grief, sadness, etc. Yeah, so I think definitely like leaving XR in itself was like a hard time to realise just like that it had problems and that you know, the solutions didn't come as easy as that. And so, yeah, definitely that was a hard time. But another thing to just say is that um, children just don't tend to have those feelings as much as adults do, you know, it's just like, <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah, again, like just the influence that the world has had on you to make you feel bad, like because you're most likely being oppressed for one reason or another, you know, you haven't had literally as much time to feel oppressed, which means that, um, yeah, you'll both have like a better point of view on like the world and stuff and as well just like better feelings about the world so yeah mm. thank you thank yeah you. i was thanks i was wondering um your thoughts on i mean obviously a lot of children have experienced home schooling for the first time in their lives um because of the pandemic um but now um, I mean, that may actually mean that people want different things from school teaching or more people were thinking about homeschooling. What do you think, um, uh, how do you think curriculum like, should be designed and, and what do you think young people like you should be learning now, given the, the way the world is and what, what looks like is ahead because of climate disruption and also because of your values around anti-oppression? What should be being taught? Yeah. So um, the school system, just to put it shortly and simply, is completely broken <laughs> and completely bad and is completely purpose to create a very small amount of actual people who feel empowered and people to make any type of change to become a leader of a company or do any big quote unquote job. Um, and important quote unquote job. <laughs> Obviously, you know, it's not bad. But it's um, so I think, so yeah, the system is completely broken and so just to, just to give some background, I think that the purpose of the school system was to purposely influence um, native peoples to become part of the currently capitalist system. So the way it would work is um, I don't know if it was like a painting or drawing, drawing or something, but there's a painting or drawing of like um, a white woman coming from the West, scaring away the Native Americans and the wild animals fleeing her. And she's like this huge woman. And, 
and she's got the star of the empire here and then behind her comes white settlers and in her arm is a school book <laughs> and so like, that is literally where it started and so the purpose of it was um was to like train like you know like native americans and people who are very much connected to the earth and you know, not interested otherwise in capitalism and you know all that sort of stuff which the um west economy was trying to um put forward um so the purpose of it was to train them to become workers and to become more like the white west and not to give them skills to survive and skills to live and they and they took them away from the um their native cultures and stuff and they influenced them to become you know white middle class style people basically or at least try you know most of them will end up like not actually getting a good education which is actually important for anything most of them will just like go on to the work system which obviously doesn't really accomplish much and it isn't that fun yeah <laughs> which, so you want to see a very big big change a change in not just bits and pieces not just some subject areas but a change in the philosophy of education the change in the intention of education yeah and uh, yeah i feel that and i share that with you a lot um and from from all ages all the way through through university as well so um thank you uh we've got a question from brian if you say where you're calling in from as well, please, Brian. And we can't hear you, Brian. And if there we can't we hear you, all oh, good. Got me now. Okay. Hi, Elsie. I'm calling from uh, Indiana, United States. Um, and I am the dad of two young boys, two and six. And in you, I see uh, great courage and resistance. And I'd like to foster that in them. And so I see this five pivot, you know, pivotal years between the age of my older boy now and your age at 11. And I wonder what tips would you have for me as a you know, young dad to help foster that resilience? How do I bring these questions and these issues to them at these younger ages? Uh, and and is there an age when you really felt like you were ready to engage with these kinds of questions um, or, or is it more like a gradual process? Thanks. Thanks, Brian. I'm also going to say that uh, Heather, if you also want to chip in on this as well. Okay. Elsie. Yeah. So just saying like, um, definitely like, one of the main things would just be to like empower them and help them with whatever they want to do. If they're saying, I don't actually want to focus on climate activism, I want to focus on racism or sexism or oppression or something else, you know, that's their choice and you're not the one who, who gets to decide what, what they do as, as children and with their lives and stuff. And I think that's, that's definitely like, <laughs> a very key element, I think, definitely. Do you have anything to add? Um, I would say um, modeling, modeling having um, an attitude that we are powerful. And I follow a particular parenting philosophy since before she was even born. Um, it's hand in hand parenting, if you want to Google that. Um, and it's all about making sure that uh, young people have a chance to um, express their emotions and um, be fully human. Don't shut them down in any way. Home education, although I don't formally home educate her, it's unschooling. So it's just kind of following her brain where it wants to go. But modeling in the background that I know that I'm powerful and that if I see a problem, I go out there and try to fix it. And so she's been raised with that in the house. And yeah, finding out what she's interested in and then facilitating her being able to do that. So I think 
um, Brian, at this point, it isn't so much the subject, but the, um, the being able to listen to our children and take their lead in whatever they want to be doing and being, being completely relaxed and uh, as best as we can and, and modeling that we're very hopeful and empowered ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Also, maybe on this, um, Mary's mum, Harriet, if you want to uh, share your thoughts on, on this too. Hi. Oh, yeah, just listening to you, Heather, it's absolutely what I would say as well. Um, um, Elsie and Mary are only a few months apart. Um, last year, especially, Mary went through quite significant and um, intense anxiety that lasted quite a few months. And um, I went through the whole remit of uh, the whole gamut of, of feeling the grief that I was the one bringing this to her um awareness that i didn't want to hold back from telling her the, the the sort of the scientific stuff and all of that and having to sort of get myself out of the way and really listen to what she needed to hear um as guidance and so that was actually why why this, the podcast was set up and from that you know we just met so many amazing people with such wisdom and it was such a gift and um and yeah, so it's just absolutely just wanted to reiterate what you've just said, which is the, the children um, look to us for everything. And, I, and it's, it's, a, it's a parent thing, um, you know, having those daughters. Of it's 14.30. Oh, <laughs> Siri. <laughs> um, you know, having... You obviously uh, pay close attention to the time in your house too. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> and just just being being um, mothers of, of children of this age, really paying attention what's going on, all of the stuff that's coming up, and it's just you know really really holding you in your in your role, Heather. So just want to wonderful. Say Thank you, Harriet. Thank you. Well, we've got time for one very quick last question from Madis. Madis, say where you are, and a uh, question for Elsie, please. Hello, I'm from Estonia, and uh, thanks for this excellent uh, episode today. And this is a question for Elsie. So given that you have achieved so much already and done so much already, and given that you said that you have found this community to be a very, very crucial point or, or end point to raise resilience, are you planning to establish deep adaptation kits? You probably she doesn't probably know much about deep deep penetration, I so she wouldn't. Mm -hmm. know what that is, but maybe Jen's community. Um, I'll Elsie. I'll, I'll send you some information on 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 who we are. Believe it or not, everybody, I don't go around telling everyone what deep adaptation is all the time, um, and uh, so <laughs> so I will send it to to Heather and and Elsie. And let's see. I mean, it would be brilliant to have you on board, involved, uh, Elsie and Heather, in what's becoming a, a fascinating international conversation and movement of initiatives of all kinds. Um, for me, your analysis is very compatible. For me, uh, a creative, wise, compassionate, just response to the climate tragedy is all about questioning power, challenging oppression, and making sure that we don't um, replicate the abuses that brought us into this situation in the first place. So I think there's strong resonance um, with everything you said today, um, Elsie. I just want to say Ejna's left a message in the chat. She's inviting us to mark the World Peace and Prayer Day with Chief Arvel Looking Horse, uh, 18th to 20th of June, and it's linked uh, with International Children's Month. You know, I didn't even know there was an International Children's Month. So thank you, Ejna, for that information. Thank you, everyone, for joining. I've had a um, very enjoyable and inspiring hour with you, Elsie. Uh, so thank you very much for, for joining. And thank you, Heather, also for making this possible. If everyone unmutes and says bye-bye, that would be lovely. Thank you. Bye.
Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.